I've said to Ram that I'm going to call this um, introduction that I'm going to do on being and becoming a revolutionary. You see, the aim of this evening's this is not my Bible, this is just um, the aim of this evening's book launch is actually to draw attention. Draw attention to themes and issues as he's outlined already that are timely. He said that. Now, the issue of what time we're living in has always haunted me. Um, as a young person already, I used to wonder about what's timing our time. I'm still looking for that answer. And Raymond provides us with some insight into that. So, this evening is really about um, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> drawing uh, attention to come to our senses. And I know I'm using a couple of another book that you are committed to reading about mindfulness. But it is about calling us to our senses. This is not about Validating rant. I'm not a group, I never was. It's not a drawing of attention to himself because he'd hate that. He wasn't trained to do that. It's also not a romantic reminiscence of his past. In fact, there's something far deeper here, and I would advise you not to buy his book if you're not prepared to take on the risk of what he's talking about. You see, Raymond is through this book, as far as I'm concerned placing us before an invitation. And that invitation is a to consider the risk and the cost of revolutionary practice and commitment. Its intent is to consider the journey. You know, the, you'll see on the cover of this book, you'll see the defiant young man coming out of court with his mantra. And at the back, you're going to see the picture of Raymond with a lovebird. Both of these pictures are pictures of what I call incarnate meaning. The first picture incarnates the resolution and the anger and the outrage of a defiant young man. The picture at the back incarnates a different kind of meaning. It's a meaning of uh, compassion, connection, of love. Now that journey between those two positions is what this book is about. And the invitation that he's putting out to us is to reconsider the meaning of revolutionary fidelity and authenticity. He mentions it in his book. You see, the journey starts, I think, with a responsiveness which he outlines quite clearly to the scandal of abject, non, or non essential, and unnecessary suffering which flows from the exploitation and oppression of our people. It's the transition that marks the transition from being a bystander to a witness. You see, a bystander is indifferent to the suffering of other people. But a witness is drawn in by a revulsion that is barely understood. It gets clarified as one goes on. He's witnessing by engaging in a struggle to reorder the current disorder that he has discovered. A disorder that is passed off as order, which is the same problem that we have today. There's a disorder that's being passed off as order. The impunity with which things are done is just amazing. It's captured so well by uh, an ethical philosopher, Jewish lady who philosophized in the United States. 
and wrote the book Men in Dark Times and the Banality of Evil. And she points out that uh, what blinds us is not darkness, the darkness of unknowing, but what blinds us is the light, actually, of display and marketing. It's a banal thing. The struggle to transform disorder in the socio-political order, and that's what Raymond has taught me, is also about an ordering of the disorder in oneself. And that requires discipline. And that's what this book is about. We want to reorder the disorder that passes itself off as order. Not only in the socio-economic realm, but also in the realm of ourselves. And that requires a great lot of deconstruction and reconstruction. Now, to deconstruct and reconstruct, you need two weapons, which I picked up from just being with ordinary people in Soweto, in Piri, Sinawani. And those two weapons are memory and suspicion. See, memory is a revolutionary act, especially when you remember the stories of resistance. And suspicion is also an important act. Because as Marx has reminded us, appearance and reality are not the same thing. And this we see in his struggle, Raymond's struggle. It's a struggle which we all need to embark on. It's a search for wholeness in solidarity with other people. It's learning to receive the challenge of the other. Do you see, what Raymond in his book does, it's a complete das Kapital. You know that. He's offering us traces of what the struggle entails. Its unfolding and clarity are only distilled from developments, from regressions, and from solidarity. And what he reminds us of is the fact that these traces are about aesthetics, our struggle for liberation has an aesthetics about it. You can see that in Rosa Luxemburg. You can see that in the woman of our struggle. I have experienced it with Masi Zulfa. There's a beauty and an aesthetics to that struggle. It's ethical. It's critical. It's rational. But above all, it's loving and passionate. It's about desire. You see, he expresses this fidelity to this cause in this way. He says, I've chosen a path that I know is right. I've also known that I pay a price for it. And that's part of being a revolutionary. So the recovery and the reordering of this order is actually an ongoing journey. And a journey is a big theme in his writing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ernst Bloch. He wrote the book on hope, the principe, the hoffnung. And he says in his book that the work of Marx consists of nine tenths icy cold blue scientific economic analysis and one tenth of revolutionary fire, great revolutionary. And I think this explains a lot about um, Raymond's work too. Apparently Marx, when he completed the first volume of Das Kapital, said, I'm not a Marxist. <laughs> and the reason he said that, we all know, is that he, he did not want his work to be construed as some doctrine something to be believed under threat of death. It was something to guide us in our work. And you see, in that, in Marx's work, that one death, the red fire, permeates all those volumes of Das Kapital. The memory that I'm referring to are dangerous memories, which he alludes to. The memory of Graham Fisher, 
Albert Latuli, Chris Haine, David Rack, Ngomboni um, Sokasa. It's no accident that we're here on the 12th. We're very close to the 16th of June. And it's important to remember. You see, if you don't remember, you're allowing the dead to be dead. And the purpose of being insurrectionary is to resurrect the dead. The aspirations of the dead. And I think that that's also something of his commitment. Is how we bring to fulfillment the unrealized dreams and struggles of people like Ruth first. We can count all of them. For so many. I'm just going to end very quickly. Okay. Carry on. I think it's okay. Yeah, carry on. I can't get out of my preaching mode. So. <laughs> um, you see, what's crucial about what Raymond is inviting us to do is that we become permanently, in a way, exiles until such time as justice is restored. It's a long journey. He was been, he's been, in, in spite of years of prison routine, he could mobilize a poet's joy. You know that act of befriending the birds? It's a poet's joy that's extracted from, it's distilled from great suffering. I just want to end off with a quote from Rosa Luxemburg. No democracy without socialism. No socialism without democracy. There's a second quote that I want to offer you, and that's from a contemplative called Thomas Merton. If I imagine you, I am mistaken. If I understand you, I am deluded. If I am conscious and certain that I know you, I'm crazy. The darkness is enough. And I pay tribute here to Jewish mystics, to Muslim mystics like Rumi, and mystics in all traditions including Martin.